Hello there, I'm Callum Johns and welcome to the EU in Review, where I review the Star Wars Expanded Universe as I experience it. Now this time I was going to do just issues 70 to 72 of the classic Marvel Star Wars run, but I thought, uh, I don't really want to break it up. So this is going to be a special edition, where I do episode 70 to 107. I'm going to talk about all of them. Now, of course, I'm introducing my new spoiler-free section, and this is the first comic run I'm doing since I did the spoiler-free section, so this will be cool. So this will cover the whole run because, to be honest, they're fairly similar as far as the writing and stuff, apart from any specifics that I mention in the spoiler section. So, the plots I think are overall pretty good. The ideas using them are creative and actually quite good for an early run with a bit different interpretation of what Star Wars is. And there's some really great stuff that came out of it. And, well, we know Lumia exists as a character. Lumia's a great, got a great story, for example, throughout the few issues that she has coming back here. And, yeah, it's great. Overall plot on paper, the only real issue I have with the plot on paper goes to the continuity section of having Luke's lightsaber appear after he lost it in Empire Strikes Back. But, that happens. Now the dialogue is quite interesting in these because you get some talking like, how I imagine them when I'm reading it is quite a bit of a Cockney accent. And I don't know if that's intentional, or if, like, if they were supposed to sound uneducated in some parts compared to some that were. It seems the case in some parts. However, I, the dialogue isn't quite as good as what a more modern Star Wars comic would be like from Dark Books. Of course I mean from more modern Star Wars comic, because I haven't read the other ones, so I'm just reading AU, so yeah. And the suitability, I think, of the dialogue in the context of these Marvel Star Wars comics is quite good. As far as suitability to Star Wars as a whole, eh, it does depend on who is writing. So there is that. I do think with the writing style, the pacing is fairly good. And the detail that goes into, well, the detail in the dialogue is fairly good because they, a lot of the time they don't put too much detail in the actual dialogue and let the art show the story as well so that's good and the use of language is quite good as far as English language they have new words and stuff like that in a way like they call some things some odd things it's like surely you could use the later EU name for it but that's of course in hindsight and they didn't have a lot of those names earlier on. The art over the whole run, I think, does improve. But the art actually peaks, I think, around episode, episode around issue 80, and then it sort of goes down a little bit as far as how good the art is. And I thought the art has its own sort of charm to it after reading the whole series, and it's quite good. And continuity, I think I mentioned before, there's a couple of errors like Luke Skywalker, mainly Luke, having his lightsaber after Empire Strikes Back when he didn't before, um, that's actually ma the main thing I can think of. Apart from some things like they appear in one lot and then they disappear in the next, or there's a other odd Marvel detail. But doesn't quite line up. But that's why these are the older ones, before they were as continuity minded, and so that's where you go, yes, you understand that, you know when these were released, it was before 1991. Before the huge interest in Star Wars and being one connected timeline, and so, you take that into account. Also, I feel like, near the end of the Marvel Star Wars run, around 1907, that there were issues that should have been given longer to be able to tell the story properly and the, you really notice that 
they cancelled it with the last issue because it skips over so much. But it really would have been better to really play out the story properly and see where it went. Although in the end, the last issue did seem like it was quite different to how the post-Return of the Jedi EU ended up in the end. So, I may as well just get straight into the spoiler section because that's where a lot of the meat is for the story and my thoughts on the exact specific stories. That's a bit of an overview of the whole. Okay, so issue 17, written by Mary Jo Duffy, illustrated by Kerry Gamill and Tom Palmer. I thought it was funny that everyone but Chewie looked scared on the cover. Uh, Luke is in a different outfit. It recaps what happened to Han again briefly, back in, when he was with the Carbonite. It says that Boba originally worked with Bosk and IG-88 and then cro double crossed them. So, uh, it's one of the continuity things that would be superseded by Tales of the Bounty Hunters. And Lando makes a good point that knowing double crossing makes Han and him valuable to the Rebellion. And so they're on the shadier side of things, and Lando makes a great point with that. And this issue is when they do a flashback with when Han was with the rest of the Big Three. A good time, way of having Han in the comics when at this point in time he was frozen the car. 3PO calls R2 an asteroid droid, like the droids in Revenge of the Sith, which is cool. And Luke opens by threatening Han's old friends, which... Luke sometimes doesn't act very Jedi. But of course, this is the first appearance of Danny the Zeltron. And the Zeltrons are a species, which really gets better as uh, time progresses through the comics. I really love the banter between R2 and 3PO. And I thought it was really funny how Danny instantly flirts with Luke and they continue through the whole comic. It's like she's just there to flirt with him pretty much. It's funny. And one of the other ones that's Han's old friends that's in that group says, I'm not paying you to romance the kid. And then she just retorts back, but you've never paid me. <laughs> but that was a cool moment. Um, noticing the detail on the art here is nice. Like the faces still look off and Luke is too buff compared to the live action and stuff. But the rest actually looks cool in the art style because we don't have those characters that we've seen in live action. I thought it was interesting how Han calls Luke Jr. And that's a reference to Indiana Jones, but Harrison Ford's character Indiana Jones being called Jr. by his father. And the Senexes look like flying demons, which is a cool visual. And it's interesting because it leaves a flashback without knowing what the response will be on Stannis. So issue 71 by Mary Jo Duffy, illustrated by Tom Palmer. I might not bother to say the writers and illustrators too many times forwards unless it changes drastically. Um, the, it's interesting how the pairing of IG-88 and Boss seem like two complete opposites because Boss really relies on his animal instincts while IG-88 relies on mechanical precision. But I guess that's also an opposite attract sort of thing, like they cover each other's weaknesses. I like the animalistic look of Bosk on the first page, I thought that was cool. And it looks like Luke trains with Lando a bit. As Lando pours his blaster and Luke blocks a bot casually. I wasn't really sure what the point of him doing that was, other than showing us that Luke has his lightsaber at the wrong place. But I'm not sure what the point of Lando going, hey I'm gonna shoot you and you'll block it is. Anyway, uh, asked if the weapons are fine, like, was that a weapons check? I was trying to figure this out, like, come to think of it, I didn't see a blaster bolt in the art. It's like, I also don't know if Luke knows how to fix a lightsaber if it doesn't work, because as of this time, Luke doesn't have Obi-Wan Kenobi's journal to tell him how to build the lightsaber, so yes, he doesn't know how to fix a lightsaber if it starts not working. There's a panel of Lando and Luke looking over the city, which is similar to the shot in the New Hope looking over Mos Eisley, which I thought was cool. And of course Luke with the lights over again. Really like the couple of panels where IG-88 hears something and then his eyes light up. It's like really menacing. I'm, that's one of the cool parts I like about IG-88. 
is that he's menacing and really cool. Uh, Luke, Lando's face looks a bit squashy in my panel, which I thought was funny. And Luke says, I think we took a wrong turn, which echoes his quote from A New Hope, of course. And it's so cheap a trick that Wick Jewel plays on the Stanaxes by just pretending it was all on the Imp Governor. I'm not sure whether I like that or not. Because, like, of course, Rick Jewel's sort of this grey area, bit of smuggler like harm, but he just wants to get the stuff and escape. And so he blames it on the Imperial government. And I'm a bit like, I don't really like you, but okay. And they get over enthusiastic about a Covenant block, and it isn't harm. And at the end, oh, it's a good cliffhanger at the end of this, it leaves them cornered by bounty hunters. And it's interesting that um, Chiedo was in the Carbonite block, and that was actually an interesting different twist when they were going on and on about finding Han. And at the time this was released, you wouldn't know if they were like, oh, we'll find Han, or not. But of course, they left it to the Return of the Jedi to do that. So, issue 72. I thought it's cool that IG-88 has blaster attachments for his arms instead of just holding the blaster. But that was a cool addition. It was interesting how IG-88 and Boss teamed up knowing that Luke and Lando would fall for the ruse of the wrong person in the carbonite steel. I call it a carbonite block, they call it carbonite steel. It's not really steel though. And it's cool that Bosk is in a blue outfit than his orange one in Empire Strikes Back, so they changed that a little bit. Whether on purpose or not, they did. And Lando makes a funny oh face. <laughs> like, oh. Damn, I'm in trouble. Uh, I didn't notice earlier, but the Trandoshans of well, it looked like they were drawn really weird, comparing it to Empire Strikes Back. And to later versions we got in... 3D models in video games and in later comics. I think the translations will look a bit weird. Uh, it's pretty cool how it shows Luke be besting Bosk and being more athletic and proficient with the lightsaber, even though he shouldn't have the lightsaber. It's showing Luke's progression and that he's got a lot more skill with it. Which is cool. Uh, IG-88 uses sound as a weapon against Luke and company, which is cool, I think. It's a different idea than just a straight-out blast them. And IG-88 disappointed me by not firing them. Instead, he had to call henchmen. IG-88, I thought, was more independent than calling henchmen. Okay. Seeing Chewie sneak around... And how they drew Chewie sneaking around, I thought it was funny, because there's like, he's this big hulk of a Wookiee. And then he's sneaking around like, <laughs> it's, it's funny. And Danny is, of course, as the Zeltron, flirting with Lando. And as Lando is, he just plays it as a cool player he is. It's like, yeah, babe. <laughs> it's funny. And it's interesting to show you the. the Contrast between Danny flirting with Lando and Danny flirting with Luke as well there. And I thought, oh wow, when Lando is captured, it's this Drevel character that wants to sell him. And it's Drevel that Lando used as a false name when he was going on other missions. So it's interesting how his karma back comes back to bite him because Drevel was one of his old rivals. And also, as I go along, I don't know why Chewie is grabbing the Stenax. Like, he's sneaking along and he's grabbing a Stenax and I'll probably knock him out or whatever. I'm like, can you just sneak around though if you're sneaking? And the Senex are flying, and they're not on the ground, so you're just sneaking around other places. Anyway. And there's an even worse look at the Trandoshan design they picked later on in this issue. I'm like, Ew, I don't like it. But I've got to be honest, I don't like the art for the Trandoshans in this. Well. Now, Danny makes a funny face in one panel, and it shows Danny stowing away on the fog. Surely they have something for that. Because 
stop stowaways, I would have thought of them, but of course, they don't seem to. Anyway, issue 73, which is titled Lars Back. I didn't put the title, but the others for some reason were like. Oh, the Lars Bees look like little munchkin elves, I thought. That's pretty cool. <laughs> it's just funny. Uh, Danny is so clinging over Luke. And uh, it's funny how he just puts up with her. He's not like, oh no, go away. I need to make sure it won't cause problems. He's just like, yeah, I'm putting up with her. She's on my arm. She's good. Yeah. Uh, Leia's somehow picked up in between this issue and the last. Like, they seem to have a time skip and layers picked up in the Falcon as well, and she's in a different outfit. But, also, Leia looks really buff. She looks like a guy except for her sort of face and hair. And on this note, Luke looks a little... Luke looks more... Luke looks more buff in the tank top in this issue as well. I don't know what really inspired that, but the previous issue it wasn't as bad. Anyway. Danny says, hello there. Interesting use of her flirting to distract the Imperial officer, I thought. And a stormtrooper I thought had a funny line is, how come I never get assigned to any of the fun planets? <laughs> and um, why does Leia not really look like a senator in this situation? She acts hot-headed. That was something that I questioned with the writing of Leia in this. Is like... You're supposed to be approaching this like a diplomatic situation. And yet you're being hot-headed and approaching things that way. It doesn't really line up. Lando's face is priceless when he's introduced to things. Right? But it also, also as well as the last piece, it introduces a hook. H-U-H. Hey, which is a troll looking creature. And it's interesting that the last bees grow into hooks. Hooks? However you pronounce that. And also, the fight with Chewie is cool. The art is a tad inconsistent one. After looking buff, Luke looks almost too feminine in one of the other panels. And this is where the art fluctuates a bit. And I like how Danny takes off in the end with her haul of treasure. She shows she was only in it for herself, which makes a lot of sense, how she was just using the flirting to try and put people in and ingratiate herself for what her purpose was at the time. Then we have issue 74, the Iskalon effect. It's a cool holographic effect with Vader's helmet over the walls on the cover. Thought that was a good design. Uh, Luke and Leia are in different outfits. And this is a water planet, which reminded me of Camino, but there's better weather because it's sunny. And there's a mer creature, and he says, hello there. <laughs> it's funny how many times hello there comes up in these things. And apparently Lando's been at Iskalon before, which would be a really interesting story to read if that exists, if someone knows they can let you know. Oh, there's an underwater city, so I was like... Did George get inspired for Otto Gunner by the underwater city in Iskalon? Quite possible. George is a visual man and he's taken stuff from comics before and added them into the prequels. And Lando makes a joke about a fish bowl. And then I was like, um, did I have fish bowls in Star Wars? They must, at least in Marvel comics. And it's also interesting how this introduces a droid called K3PX. Is it? There's an Imperial with a prosthetic eye, which looks cool. There's a cool design for the Imperial. That's an interesting idea to actually speak, split Luke and Leia from Lando, Chewie, and the droids. Is it? Yeah, interesting. There's another hello there. And Leia's swimsuit is low cut. And they lend them from the Iskalonians. But her outfit mirrors Luke's. Like she's got the feminine version of it. Surely they could have a wetsuit, a swimsuit thing that actually looks like it covers everything and keeps her body heated. Anyway. <laughs> they did it for the comic and how it looks. Now, Luke learning to sw swim here is an interesting thing. 
happens, he didn't know how to swim in Splinter of the Mind's Eye, which I thought was a cool detail. I like how they put it in. Right, Luke learns to swim here. Splinter of the Mind's Eye is before Empire Strikes Back, so he's actually covering one of the things he can do from throwing up on the desert planet. I think it was Luke who swim. Lando mentions the Telefray Holocaust. Another appearance, more directly now, of the word Holocaust and what they called it. Because what well, and they made his comments say well, it's so PC and they're like Holocaust doesn't have to connect to the real world event, it just tells them an event that devastated the whole people. Also Lando is wearing a more Han like outfit in this issue, which is interesting. I thought it was funny as well though, that later the Superman pose with the arms out in front like that. And Luke does one but one handed. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know where you got that wrong. And at the end it has the sound effect of Crash. Which I thought of Ludo Crash. Probably direct. Nothing connecting, but just interesting. And I will say that the enclosure being broken did seem a tad predictable. Because in the end, the Empire, the Empire attacked. The whole underwater enclosure broke. So yeah. Uh, issue 75. Uh, title. Title. Titled title. I like the reflection style on the cover. And Luke looks super buff on the first page. I do like the choice to put Luke on the water planet and have stuff happen because it's like the complete opposite of Tatooine. And it's cool how Luke says that he'd be better at breath control than Leia, recognising how some of the training helped him because he'd learned how to control his breathing while training under Yoda. It's cool. Stormtroopers posing with the end of their rifles in the ground doesn't seem smart or like standard operating procedure. If it's in dirty ground, the rifles will clog up and that would cause more issues. I'm like, okay. Uh, Arto has gone off on his own a bit, is a bit of a recurring thing, even in these old comics. It's like, yeah, r has gone off and done stuff on his own. It has happened in the movies as well, but like, not as much. Not as obvious either. Lando looks like a stereotypical pirate because he goes up in the thing. In Lando looks like a stereotypical pirate because he's in a disguise. And also Lando not knowing how to explain secrecy and subterfuge to an Iskolonian is interesting. Because the Iskolonian culture doesn't have that. Uh, they made use of C-3PO with that which is cool because 3PO could actually explain it. And I did mention Dribble earlier, and I think that was just Lando using it as his cover again, but Lando here pretends to be Drebble. Drebs to his friends. I thought it was a funny name. And he goes, yeah, Drebs to my friends. <laughs> so I thought it was funny. Anyway, seeing Lando line act this way is pretty cool. Uh, it's funny how they don't immediately know who the Rebels are though, because it's like, dude, it's a Lando. You can tell, even though he's dressed up. Now, K3PX droid it. It turns up in this book. And it's not a bad look, but not the best of anything for a droid. Just one of those droid designs that was in the middle, and it's like, yeah, it could be worse, but it could be better. It looks like someone put a droid head off of it on a buff armoured body, which I thought was a bit weird. Uh, it's a similar head to the RA7 protocol droid, but with a different mouthpiece on it. Luke seems to have a massive lung capacity compared to Leia. I'll chalk it up to him knowing his breathing and being able to use the force in some way with that. And Luke calls the Iskalonians mermen, which there's no reason to call them mermen in Star Wars other than just saying, yeah, mermen. That's a real world word we use for them. And they put pull Primor, or Primor, up onto some debris. Which, he was injured or whatever, and they were pulling him up to save him. But they're fish people! So the underwater would be better for them than being pulled up into the air. 
Oh my. What? <laughs> anyway. The twist is decent at the end and leaves a nice cliffhanger. And the real reveal that K3PX is a droid spy for Vader is that's a pretty cool. And then we get to issue 76, which is titled R2D2 to the rescue. There's another giant monster. They seem to be quite keen on giant monsters in these Marvel comics. And I thought one panel, the colours reminded me of Dark Empire, which is actually nice. So the you know, probably is an intentional. And so there's some nice shading on Luke's face, so I'm noticing some of the art improving from this issue on once a And it's funny how nobody questions R2. Because he just appears there and it's just he so it makes himself useful and they go, oh well he must be requisitioned by someone. No one owns him, but that doesn't matter. We'll try and claim him. <laughs> They're fools. Anyway. I like how they thought about the water getting stale for the water tanks in the fishman suit to be able to breathe the Eskalon. I'm calling it fishman, but yeah. So the water circulates to be able to let them breathe, but they need to replenish it so that they can keep breathing. Chewie activating 3PO reminds me of Empire Strikes Back when he was carefully putting them together, which is a nice little thing. And Chewie putting a dent in the door is cool to see. It's always awesome to see the Wookiee strength. And he just slams a door and puts a huge dent in it, which is awesome. And K3PX arresting Tower is a cool moment. And Towers, the Imperial control of the facility on Iskalon's sister planet or whatever it was. It's cool. And of course, Asu rescues them. He is the hero of the story, as uh, the title says. And oh, Chewie converging on a stormtrooper is brutal and I love it. Because he just goes around, grabs the stormtrooper and then snaps his neck. That's really cool. And R2 does seem like an overpowered hacker, but of course it's droid, and that's his program. He ordered the computer to interfere with any pursuit given to the main characters and to leave them alone, which is like, yeah, you're making R2's hacking skills really powerful. And Vader completely owns Tower, it's cool to see. Not the building tower, of course, the character. And Luke not wanting to hang around and let a friend die is great, Luke not I think it's like, I don't want to hang around when there's the opportunity my friend might die, I need to go and do something for him. That's what they do. And there's a great artistic panel with them going through the hordes. It ends with Moan Mo deciding to, hey Mo and e. Deciding to leave the fish, lead the fishmen into the depths, and for no interactions with the air breathers as long as there is an empire, which is quite interesting. After everything happened, it makes sense that the species will want to isolate themselves even more from the empire. Although, to be honest, it seems like, yeah, they already know you're there. Then they come back. Anyway, issue 77, which is titled Chantus of the Star. And the first page has 3 PO assaulted by Huji. I was actually just them greeting him, which it looks silly to make his 3 PO doing his normal joking and stuff. Like, it seems a bit childish, but of course these comics are for children more. With 3 PO being so scared of the Huji and then going, no, they're just greeting him. Anyway. Leia, I thought it was funny, was practically drooling over Han's hollow projection. <laughs> which is funny how she went so far from before Empire Strikes Back and them going, oh, she kisses Luke a few times, this is weird, to, oh, now she's drooling over Han, and completely forgotten about Luke as a love interest. <laughs> Probably because George Lucas let them in or something there, and said, no, they don't end up together. Leia and Luke have different clothing, which is interesting, no, white ponchos, basically. And Pliff, the Hoogie, offers a solution. How much power do they have? And apparently he detected the precise nature of the problem of the situation they were going into. Leia in the blue dress looks pretty. And, oh goody, they encounter more Zeltrons, which is always fun. I, those Zeltrons are just used for fun. And the Hujib things are verily, which I thought was very, like, yeah, you just put that in so you could write verily. 
and they refer back to Iskalon, which is cool. And what I thought was cool about this issue is they have a bunch of the species from previous stories and issues in the Marvel run coming to gathered together in the one place, which is cool. And a couple more hello there's later. Luke gets chased by Zeltrons and it's hilarious. <laughs> I love how they just have the Zeltrons just chasing around the place and him trying to escape. It's just hilarious. And there's a species called Persians, and they're P U R S I A N S. They're totally not Persians, like Persia, the country. Sure, right, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, there's so much sexual implication with the Zeltron talking to Luke. You'll miss it if you're kidding reading it, which is good. Oh, they also have it there so that you can watch it. It, you know, as an adult, you can read it, not watch it, and you get it, and you're like, oh boy. Now, Leia got caught, which is funny, and the funny part is she's put in a bikini, and it's gold, really, this whole thing. And she actually sings, and people like it. Connection to the holiday special? Um, one of the, la the uh, yeah, one of the funny bits as well is the la one of the Larsby's by being overstimulated by Leia, reaches puberty and turns into a hook. <laughs> it's a great moment. You have to read it to get the full context, but it's like. There's just all these adult jokes in it, which is hilarious. And Leia calms the beast by singing. Because apparently he was obsessed with it, and that worked. However, it works, yeah. Uh, this issue is hilarious, and it's situational humour as well, which I really love, and... Uh, hilarious. Anyway. Issue 78, which is called Hoth Stuff. Do do. Talking about Hoth Stuff. Anyway. Uh, Luke seems to place a lot of importance on Wedge, suddenly. And there's Lieutenant Barlon Hightower. And if that name isn't familiar to you, I think a police academy with Hightower. And I think this issue was released after the movie, but I'm not sure. Now Luke seems to be really losing it in this issue, which is interesting because he doesn't act like a Jedi and like the good guy. He's very brutal and sort of losing it. Now Leia says Wedge grew up with Luke on Tatooine. I'm like. Huh? I think they're confusing Biggs with Wedge. Because that's just weird. Anyway, Wedge tells a story through some logs left on the derelict ship where it seems that Jansen, Wes Jansen, well, it teams Wes Jansen up with Wedge, which is really cool because this connects to the Rogue Squadron series, the X Wing series, I should say. The Rogue Squadron. And it's interesting how Wedge is stuck on Hoth, exploring some of that aftermath is a good idea. Because they're stuck on Hoth after the Empire attacked. Had to find a way to survive. Mm. I thought the Wampas looked different when Empire Strikes Back. They did better out of them on the cover of the issue, but they didn't do very good inside. As far as the work put into it, I think. Like, they could be more accurate to how they looked in the movies, to be honest. And there's another weird thing, it's like, if Wedge apparently has a girlfriend on Tatooine. Some of this is just weird, it's like... Yeah, you didn't really know his backstory before you wrote this, did you? And so the backstory for him that comes later, and material by release date, would be more accurate. But I like how it had Wedge grow a beard over the top. Like, he didn't shave at all because he couldn't. And the, the good thing about this, though, is Wes Jansen dies in this comic, which is later referenced in the X Wing series. And even though it has a bit of a difference with, say, Wedge having a girlfriend on Tatooine and stuff, it's actually told as a story to the Rogue Quadrant recruits, which is cool. There's a different alien species with the scavengers that come, which is cool. And there was a smoking alien, of course, like... An alien smoking. Um, 
Which is clever, sabotaging the gun tugs and getting the scavengers killed by the tires. Because it's cool how it really shows Wedge's ingenuity and him working on a ground sort of mission. Which we see later in the X-Wing series, but we didn't see Wedge do ground mission stuff before, so that sets up some of his skill set as well. And then Wedge with the tank top, with the bin and everything, that, that look just reminded me of Wolverine. For whatever reason, it just reminded me of it. And there's a good view of Leia in a jumpsuit in this issue. And I knew Wedge would survive, but come on. He was outside in a spaceship. So that the. No, not a spaceship. He was outside in a spacesuit so that the ship didn't pick up the life signs when they came on board and just queried the ship to see what life signs were on board. And like, cheap trick. Like, it's a really interesting idea doing that, but like. I don't know, this. Seriously. Anyway. It's actually cool how this turns out to be a story that happened a week after the Battle of Hoth in Empire Strikes Back. It's a really impactful survival story of the time wearing on and Wedge being on his own. It does quite well on bringing that time bearing down on him and how it's affecting him. I'm noticing at the moment how much the art has improved, which is great. The faces compared to the movie characters are still a weird shape, but it also has its own sort of charm to it. Which I know mentioned earlier, but I don't know to mention it again. This is issue 78, two issues before I think uh, peaks. And good to note that this comics, these comics, have to at least be partially canon to the end, since Wes Jansen's death is in it, and they followed that for future material. Which is cool. And you read the X Wing series. Yeah. Next is issue 79, The Big Con. So this title was teased earlier, but they did the Wedge story in between. Like in issue 77 they said, oh the next issue will be The Big Con. But then they did the Wedge story in between, I'm like, okay, why did you try and advertise that there was the right one anyway? The first page has really nice out of hand solo. It zooms out to be a poster and degrades in quality, but that one panel on the first page is great. And there's a bunch of Han haters, which is funny. Uh, they mentioned Han's bounty was 100,000 credits, which is cool. And then Arkham 4, which is the first appearance of that planet. Chewie appears in a poncho, which is a different look for him. And there's a funny joke with the prostitutes. As I say, you only get lucky if you're unlucky. Captain Drebble again appears, but it's Lando again. And he looks quite different with white hair and a purple cloak this time. But what I love about this one is it shows Lando bluffing as Captain Drebble and showing his moves, which the, was, Lando really shines in this issue. And Lando references back to Han finding the statue of Vol on Senex, which is a cool reference. And Lando in the end comes off as a badass. All an act which is ever better. Because he can just act like a badass and own it. And Lando putting the eye patch on the wrong side first before he heads back out is funny. And Chewie eating the food is funny as well. Yeah, I never know. But, yeah. They find out that Jabba has Han while undercover, which I think is a cool way of finding out. Although if supposedly everyone knew that they were with, I don't know why Lando didn't hear about it early. Hey. Drunk Lando was fun. I don't know how he seems to have cleared his head. Because he gets into trouble and clears his head instantly it seems like. Unless it was an act of how drunk he was of course. There's an awesome car ch air car chase. And Chewie jumping on some of the pursuers is a great moment because Chewie's in the air car and then he jumps across the pursuers and just. That's awesome. A sound effect of a speeder crashing is apparently Bluey. B L O O E Y. Okay. Kablooey, I guess. 
You know, Lando having both statues in the end and playing everyone for a fall is great. And there's a little comic at the end where a guy pretends to dress up as Darth Vader, which is nice. And this issue, issue does great at the situation of him, I think, where he looks like episodes. Episode, I keep saying episode. Issue 77. Now, on to issue 80. Titled Ellie. No, you get that title as I explain it. It starts off with in the middle of them hiding, and I don't know what's going on, so we missed a bit of story. Luke and Leia are wearing ponchos reminiscent of Return of the Jedi. Luke has his dark clothing underneath that you can see too. So it seems like they had some of the concept that I've done for Return of the Jedi, and they gave it to the Marvel guys and said you can make the outfits look similar to this, which is cool. Because they're still after Tay Vanus and the information on his tapes about a super weapon, which they must place a lot of importance on it to keep doing so, because they failed before. Ellie is a sleek looking silver droid, supposedly working for the Imperials, which it is at the time. In the same panel, there's text on a sign by the droid which looks like it should mean something. I can't read it. Anyway. There's a panel showing 3PO behind L-E. And now the letter L and the letter E is together, and so they call the droid Ellie. Shows a difference between them as well, which is cool because it's a different type of droid. One with a more feminine shape, which is interesting. And I would imagine with a feminine voice. Oh, Luke has his lightsaber again, which he shouldn't have. And with that, he slices off a Stormtrooper's arm, so that's cool. You get to see the lightsaber in action properly when it comes out, so it's cool. It's nice lighting and style in one panel, panel of Luke. And apparently, Ellie absorbs a glass of bowl. And I was going, how? And suddenly, Ellie helps him after absorbing the glass of bowl. And there doesn't seem really to be a cause for it other than programming by Vanus. This being a child is not trusted, I guess. And then 3PO is spilling all the beans of what's going on to this droid that they don't even know they can fully trust yet. Stupid. Luke as well specifically mentions that they are Botham tapes. So I'm guessing more information George gave to them saying that Botham's found the planets of the second Death Star. They now have to retrieve the Botham tapes, which is a um, contradiction to other stories where they had to find the. Yeah, the other story. I forget exactly which book it was in here, but the other story where they had to go and find the tapes and the bottoms. That was through. Yeah. The other version of the story is later, there's more canon in this one. Ellie explains how it was a modified to be blaster proof by its previous master, and that is presumably Tay Vanus. So it's interesting you can get blaster proof plating for droids. Leia is in a jumpsuit very much like the You Can Do It posters, <laughs> which I thought was funny. And apparently Tay Vanus and his partner, Yomargo, found the Botham tapes and was going to deliver them to the Rebellion. So theoretically the Bothans weren't even on the Rebellion side. The other mob just seemed to find them and knew that they contained information in the Rebellion mob. Oh yes, Shadows of the Empire had the other story. Yeah, this would have caused a big continuity error with Shadows of the Empire if they didn't make these comics S canon. Which, for the sake of just reading them and enjoying them, it doesn't matter about the canon tears. But you know that these are older and that like... Right, they wanted to tell the story in a better way, and so they did that in Shadows of the Empire. Luke, without the poncho, he does have his Revenge of the so, Jedi here. Yeah. Return of the Jedi outfit on. Dark with the grey interior, which is cool. And Luke noticeably clips the lightsaber to his belt, which he shouldn't have the lightsaber in. 
Uh, Vader placing holograms for Luke is a great psychological play because, of course, they couldn't have Vader versus Luke because Luke would just get killed. So they had Vader just fight, playing the psychological game with Luke and leaving the hologram to really play mind games with him, which is great. Because it was after Wotham tapes and then Vader goes, Ha ha, this was all a trap for you. It's a great one. He played them all and left them with what's left of Vanus, which is a great reveal. Love it. And Ellie gives them the tapes, which it didn't destroy as ordered, because they had the tapes with it, and it was ordered to destroy it if Venice didn't come back in a certain amount of days. But it betrayed the paper, which is uh, the orders, I should say, which is funny, but they got the tapes. And uh, it's a beautiful shot, a beautiful art. Where Ellie is left embracing what's left of Tay Vanus, still alive, but broken completely by Vader. And I love this because it shows how depraved Vader is, how far he will go just to break, try and psychologically play with the rebellion and the creators. And I'd say this is where the art peaked. And it sort of plateaus for a bit and then drops a little bit in my opinion. But yeah, I love that. Then we have something completely different in issue 81, which is the comic titled Jawas of Doom. It's got a nice cover art. And it's a story about Han amongst the Ewoks. It says about how he was just freed. But it jumps from issue 80 to issue 81 without having the adaptation of Return of the Jedi in between, which was done as a separate plot, which I thought was weird, because they did the previous two in the main run of Star Wars Marvel Comics, and yet they did Revenge of the, S Revenge of the Jedi, Return of the Jedi separately, which I thought was weird. Apparently Han is trying to convince an old friend to join him, unsuccessfully, on Endor. And I don't know why he's there. Is this just after the... F I'm assuming this is just after the victory celebration. Um, Han says, I'm a general now, which is referenced to in <laughs> General Solo. And chewing nothing with the Ewoks is cute. Han getting caught up in a I don't belong to anything seems a bit odd given how he just said he was a general in the rebellion. He's recognised for things. Wedge appears in a blue jumpsuit. Not sure where that outfit comes from, but hey, he does. And Leia thinks Boba Fett died, as pe other people assume as well, which is interesting because it's before the reveal that he's alive to Salak. And Han goes back to the Falcon and it still has the satellite dish on it. Where if this was just after the victory celebration, then it should still be knocked off. Little details. But it's interesting how in this issue, Han pays attention to the dice from that one shot in A New Hope, which is a very small detail. It's an interesting thing they have the little bit of a saying, okay, these are the done dice of one more Millennium Falcon. And that's it. But it gives a little cool reason for him having the dice there and that's all they need is a little reference amongst the other story. Han having a small breakdown, I won't say it's good to see but it's a good way the story goes to see as everything overwhelms him and now he has to process it after being stuck in Carbonite for so long. And Chewie apparently wanted to stay on Endor and learn some Ewok hunting techniques. Random little fact. And Leia's in a different outfit of a white jumpsuit with the zip open, of course, because she's female, which is interesting. But the big thing about this one is the Jawas pick up Boba Fett's body. Them showing Boba Fett's body means he's alive. George's involvement with even these old Marvel series run and approving this plot point means that George wanted him alive too. It's also quite different to the later story because this takes place chronologically after the Mandalorian armor and Tales from Jabba's Palace. So that's where you go, 
Oh, this would have so many issues if we weren't told about Tissus. But we also recognise that it's all older stuff, and it won't as continue anymore. No. It's also said that Jaws have a protocol droid giving them what looks like advice for being a go-between. This is interesting. And the funny thing is the Jawas think the Boba's a droid. Somehow. Anyway. It says the last time Han was on Mosasa, he took off without paying the docking fees. So I guess that's a new hope and it was meaning even though the Millennium Falcon was there during the time of Shadows of the Empire and that, that they didn't have to talk about that. Unless there was an answer. It's interesting that a local is building up that the Jawas are mean and greedy after Jabba almost put them out of business. Because the Jawas will be Jawas. The main ones are the Tuscan Raiders, which is their offshoot species. Their species divergence. Han arguing with the bank teller because the customer is frozen is funny because it's like his own bank account. And he goes, But I'm the owner. <laughs> no, our records state that Han Solo is frozen in carbonite. <laughs> Um, there's a touching moment with Han and Leia, which is really cool. And the Jawa's droid theorised that Sark the Sarlacc regurgitated Boba Fett because he was indigestible. <laughs> Similar, funnily enough, to how it spit out Jabba the Hutt's uncle in Jedi Prince. Boba wakes up and it shows the armor in more detail and it doesn't look corroded enough like because in the stories of the Sarlacc pit and the other versions his armor gets corroded and broken down whereas it doesn't look corroded enough in this Boba, I thought it was weird that Boba acts like he's a droid with the jaws of his masters but then you, you realize he's got amnesia and it's like what? how did he get amnesia? And it is an interesting idea that he got amnesia, and they could have put that in with another part of him that's given the star like, but obviously they chose not to. And this is where people have said that he falls into the star like, I mean, twice. Boba just remembers Han from hearing Leia call his name. It causes a kerfuffle, and then the whole sand crawler falls into the star like pit with Boba. In it. It's like. Eh? What? <laughs> it's an odd one, but for Boba to fall in in that situation when you're reading it with the temporary amnesia does make sense to me. And of course, the Han and Leia adventure just after Return of the Jedi is odd too, but it's nice seeing them together on an adventure. Obviously, they wanted to do that. Uh, despite the really nice cover art, I didn't find the art as good as the previous issue. Subjective, but that's what I thought. And then we go to issue 82, which is titled Diplomacy. I was illustrated by M. Hans, whatever that is. Still written by Mary Jo Duffy. It opens with Luke in an outfit he had on earlier. A white vest over his Return of the Jedi clothing, which is interesting. Uh, it's also interesting how he's getting Ewoks to throw rocks at him in lightsaber practice. It's cool to see him being inventive with his training, but it's like, why do you know what to do? Anyway, Luke believes the rebellion part is over. <laughs> and Admiral Akbar calls Vader the Emperor's chief aide, which isn't really accurate from what we know of Vader, of course. But he calls him that. Luke is sent off to planets to invite them to come to council to decide on how the new government will run, which is an interesting thing to do. And it's interesting how they have Luke go back to Iskolon first. Uh, Luke's underclothes with the art uh, turn from blue to black. It's a bit weird. Anyway. And Danny the Zeltron appears again! Yaha! And she says, I love you, and Luke follows with, I know, so they beat, and that's just took those lines from Empire Strikes Back. I'll call it a cool little nod to him. Then Rick, Jewel, and Cheetah over here, of course, because that's their little group. Luke fighting unarmed is cool to see, which is actually one of the 
only time to see him fight unarmed properly in this run. And Luke calls the rebellion the Alliance of Free Planets now. So they're at a different stage where they're not the rebellion, but they're not the New Republic yet. And so they're the Alliance of Free Planets. And Kiro, one of the Escalonian fishmen, ends up joining Luke and leaving Escalon, deciding to leave the school trap, which is a cool thing. And we get on into issue 83, which is titled Sweetheart Contract, which is a Lando story, so that's cool. And there's odd looking helmets they wear, I love how Lando's a player even with a queen, and I come to do that. And the attack on the Citadel really does remind me of Flash Gordon visually. Well, I've seen the movie. I haven't read the comics or the t- watched the TV series, but I've seen the movie. It reminds me of that. There's some nice art in this comic. I actually quite like the art in this one. And the art of human faces seems to be improving from last I've noticed. And I like the detail on the rest of the bodies as well. So this is one with a bit better art. Then issue 84 is... Soul, Seoul Search, S-E-O-U-L. And on the first page, the art for Chewie is more accurate, and it has a glass refraction piece of, bit of art, which looks really cool. The crystal apparently can boost power from any source, even mental energy, which is interesting. And Han's dialogue is fun. I noticed the better art, even with more Imperials, since the art seems to have improved from issue 8. And the Song Trooper commentary is great as usual. The Song Trooper commentary is fun. Because they don't drag it out for too long. And what was interesting is my file was corrupted for whatever reason, so when I found it somewhere else to read it online, it was interesting how to, to note the colour changes between whatever scans people put in and the remastered sort of version they had. And this is a pretty fun little adventure. That the Crystal Hunt had activated the rest, and in the rush they exploded was a way to quickly end the story for the issue. But I feel like there's a lot of these stories that could have been given more time. Issue 85 is called The Hero. And this actually features the real character of Drebble. So from the get-go I thought this is gonna be fun. Bosk and IG-88 are working together and they also have a couple of Stenaxes, which is nice. IG-88 still being around means that one of them survives, which is interesting for me to know. Yeah. Most of the IG-88s had died, been destroyed, but one here must have survived. Well, it was interesting that Han, Chewie and Lando were playing cards with the Ewoks, and to be honest, the Ewok faces look pretty terrible. Not a fan. It's funny how Lando uses Drebbel's name had the opposite effect than he desired. Because Akbar says that Drebbel will be decorated as a hero, whereas Lando wanted to use his rival's name to give him a bad reputation. Lando's ship that he has is called the Cobra. It's the same one as the previous issue, but I didn't mention it. And that, yeah, it's different to Lady Luck, which he has later on in release order. Han handling the cure and diplomacy is interesting to read. Because he learned that from Leia, apparently, how to do diplomacy. Uh, the art for Bosk is a Trandoshan, so looks odd, I think. And, ha, uh, I thought it was funny how Drebble didn't know how to fly the Falcon. And Han and Chewie freeing themselves is a cool ploy. Chewie playing dead to surprise the guy, then Han wrapping his legs around his neck. That was a cool one. And this issue had a bunch of the older stuff from when Lando was looking for Han coming back to bite them, which is actually pretty cool. Cause, so I like how in the series it brings back things from previous stories and connects them together. Uh, issue 86, which is called The Old Run Factory, and this is actually written by Randy Stradley. Which is cool. And this story takes place before Return of Jedi, apparently, so interesting. Uh, Leia's trying to gain the Yin cause trust. It's a species of lizard people, from the look of it, which is interesting. And Leia mans a gun turret, which is cool, taking matters into her own hands. And Leia going on about being a princess isn't as good as I think if they have put she has to do what 
do it as she's in the situation, that's what she does. And she goes on about, I have to do this because I'm a princess. And it's like, no, you're doing it because that's the best thing to do in the situation. I think Captain Wessel is a, related to an earlier issue, but I forget exactly. Uh, they have a stormtrooper in a normal outfit instead of the TIE pilot uniform. A trooper. And then the stormtrooper being from Old Run and helping Leia is actually a really cool different story. And it's a really cool twist on it. There's a Rob McGee, which is a new creature. Captain, Rem Captain Wessel reminds me of Tarkin with Leia and how he treats her. And yeah, the stormtrooper helping Leia. It's a really impactful story, I really like this one. The twist at the end felt really emotional after the slower pacing of the Stormtrooper. You think he's going to turn, and then he does, but then he dies instantly, which is a like, wow. And the art for Leia was better than his issues. Issue 87, this title is still active after all these years. It's got a cool cover. And uh, we're returning to Danny, Rick, Cheeto, and Kiro. Because Kiro ends up going with them for a bit. Going as representatives of the Alliance for a change, which is cool. And Luke is travelling with Pliff a fair bit. So they're like, getting together as a team. Sandhor, the leader of the Shorken, which is a new introduction, says the Empire is now defunct. Although by now, this would be still be before they took Coruscant. Luke then mentions the remnants seem lacking there. So that it seems like Imperial remnants have been popping up a bit over the place, but they seem lacking on this planet. And of course, Shorken is a new planet. Danny's comments are crazy. She's there for comedy relief, I believe. And she's obsessing over Luke, and every word out of her mouth is a flirt with him in this issue. It's funny. The band of criminals getting into trouble in the ruins is funny and promises some good intrigue. And it's funny when Cheeto breaks off the lever so they can't get out. And now it has Luke's green lightsaber which lined up. It's good. And it's good how they have a use for Pliff to open the door. He drains all the electricity out because who gives the electricity and energy? There's a typo on page 18 I found that says Go, go, down here, there. <laughs> Instead of just go down there. And Luke's lightsaber activates underwater. So however, Obi-Wan constructed in lightsaber, the instructions include how to make water resistant. Issue 88 is titled, Figure. Mon Mothma has blue hair for some reason. She's had red hair in an earlier issue, so you can't say that, oh, these issues just have that colored hair. And Lumia appears. Uh, I know who it is, but at the time of the reveal, they didn't. So it was interesting to see how it goes. There's a character named Finn. And I think there's a connection to that name in another novel as well, in Ruins of Dantooine, the Souls Galaxies novel, that has Finn... Delfridian? I want to say Delfridian, but it's probably not right. Leia saying no Zeltrons is funny. Because uh, Leia seems to have a bit of a prejudice against Zeltrons from the way they act, which is funny. And Mom Mothma getting the wrong idea about it is also funny. And Leia, Leia which is in top of Lumia. It's cool to see Leia in action. And then Leia on the run is a great read. On into the next issue, issue 89. Oh, yeah, issue 88 was Mary Jo Duffy again, and issue 87 was Mary Jo Duffy, and then issue 89 is written by Anne Nocenti, illustrated by Brett Blevins. It sounds like I'm saying Star Wars names to people's real names, but anyway. I'll see you in the throne room is what issue 89 is titled. Luke's lightsaber is blue in this issue, which is weird. The deposed king, I thought, looked like a red hulk. So, I guess I wanted to draw something similar looking. Oh, uh, Luke is infatuated with the blonde woman, Mary. That was 
by Ragold when he was killed, and I don't really know why. This seems like he's on this world, and they're charging in, and then the leader of the rebels, Ragold, dies, and the blonde woman is by him, and I'm like, why are you infatuated with this blonde woman? It seems to rush this as he gets close enough to imply that they want time to themselves elsewhere. I'm like, that's a rush, you hardly knew it. The Empire inevitably came and she was shot. It was a bit emotional, but I felt like we didn't have enough time with the character to be really feeling for it. And she dies in his arms. It would have had a lot more weight if it wasn't rushed, apparently. They only did everything over a week, which, if they spent more time, showed us him spending more time with her, then we might have felt more for it. But Luke seems different in this story as well, how he's it's like, I wish I were a god does reflect Anakin, which is cool. And this is interesting, because Luke sets out on a revenge spree, and pretty much tortures a guy, flaunting his money with girls around him, and everything is like, Luke's completely gone off the deep end, he's gone, screw the light side, I'm just getting what I want, I'm getting my revenge, and I'm angry. Which is not how I would imagine Luke acting after Return of the Jedi. And not how he's portrayed in all the later materials. Well. There's a jetpack with wings that fold out, which is cool, so instead of like a proper jetpack, it actually has wings and he flies with the wings. Uh, it's interesting how different Luke seems, and how he snaps at a kid, and it's pretty much consumed by the dark side, it seems, for a bit. That's all. Uh, Braxis is a different species that it looks interesting. It's a species. And this is the first it comic with chopsticks in style. So that's interesting. But this seems to add so much in so little time, they didn't have enough time to really flesh out the story properly. But it's interesting that the ending was that Ragal committed suicide after being a traitor himself. And this just feels like an odd roller coaster that was rushed. They really didn't hold back in this issue. Luke kisses a girl, then girls are gathered around a fat bloke. Then... I've got black hair. I don't know if that's about right. I'm not a typo. Yeah. It makes sense. It's the ex-king, the Red Hulk guy, steps on someone and then complains about blood on his boots to show how bad he is. It just feels really rushed. Like they had all the ideas they wanted to fit in the single issue that they had, and it's just too rushed. Anyway. Issue 90. Back to Mary Jo Duffy and illustrated by Tom Palmer. Titled, The Choice. Leia's wearing the same dress as from issue 88. Just thought, wouldn't it be torn if she has a new one? Leia's surprised that Danny appearing is funny, with her old Zeltron prejudice. And it seems like the previous issue didn't happen. Completely like ignored it seemed like. Luke returns to his black outfit and they own a different one. It is interesting how Kiro asks to be trained as a Jedi and Luke says no. And how Kiro feels upset up. And it's cool because they show some new varieties of aliens at the conference for the Alliance of Free Planets. This is really a short one where the main action is a distraction from them, while the main decision was shown at the end to not have Han, Luke, Leia and Chewie as able to govern with the Alliance of Free Planets because they weren't there. Which is just weird, it's like, eh? But it is a setup to more story later on. But it's come on, it's like, they weren't able to make it. Where they can't govern. <laughs> Surely they would find out why they weren't able to make it. Anyway. Issue 91. It's called Wookie World. It got Chewy right with the art on the first page, which I loved because it finally got Chewy right with the art. And Han, Lando, and Chewy went to Kashyyyk. The, it lines up even back to when this came out that the Wookiees were inside by the Empire. The tree houses line up with how they look in the holiday special. Also, Chewie's family has the same as in the holiday special. So that all lines up with the one continuity. It's good. It's a good little story of Chewie returning home, then knife, 
which also came from another issue, causing a problem by trying to reactivate the slave trade. There's more on my later. Issue 92. This is illustrated by Jan de Seema, which is cool. And this is the dream. And so Luke's in a different outfit, Leia's also in a different outfit. And it's interesting how Leia seems to be on the side of seeing Vader as good in the end before she's forgiven him in Trisha Bakura. Because I'm assuming that this issue takes place before the Trisha Bakura, but it might take place afterwards, which would make more sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. This establishes early on Luke's character flaw that is throughout the post-return of the Jedi expanded universe. He is afraid of the dark side and leading people into it. Thinking back to that other issue, but finding a sentient is like, what? I mean, it's interesting that Yoda, Obi-Wan and Anakin appear seemingly as force ghosts in a dream like Obi-Wan did in Air to the Empire. And Luke has a blue lightsaber instead of the green one, he should have. Anyway. It's interesting how Flint is a bad guy from the hint of him going with Vader the train. Also, Denon became a whole lot more interesting with the reveal that he died and his twin sister took his place. I noticed in the art in some of the places they made her look more feminine after that reveal, which is actually pretty cool how they put the little details. As a funny part with the Stormtrooper interrupting things as well. Uh, this was a longer issue than previous ones, more like the issue 50 special length, and I don't know why it was because of the issue 92. Anyway. Uh, issue 93, titled Cat's Ball. They introduce Minka, a rebel pilot from the Cantor system. She's a cat species. Uh, it's different looking to the Kappa, at least that I'm familiar with. And all of the cat people look interesting. I've got to say, I'm not a huge fan of the design for cat people here. And it's interesting that they were deluded into thinking that Luke and company were Imperial. It's nice that they focus on a different rebel pilot as well, a bit more on introducing new characters there. Then we have issue 94. Again, Mary Jo Duffy, still. And there's Small Wars, it's cool. Oh, issue 93 was illustrated by Tom Palmer again in this one as well. Uh, it's interesting how this story starts showing that without an enemy to unite against, the Rebellion or the Alliance of Free Planets now start to fight amongst themselves, which is actually cool. Leia is in an orange jumpsuit that looks like prison garb, and she also has an odd pose, but anyway. I want to found really hilarious with the Hiromi introduced here, and they're cockroach people. Well, I'll turn up more later. And it's funny how the Ewoks declare war on the Lars Bees, the two less intimidating looking species. And then the Hiromi, the cockroach people, want to take over! It's like, and they're a huge comedy release with the rest of the fun. There's an Ewok with a Stormtrooper helmet, which is funny. And Danny appears and is in a different outfit, which is cool. And there are more of the cockroaches, but they're wearing hats as well, which is funny. And, of course, it's funny how Hirok behind the scenes is trying to take out the Alliance gets foiled by random things that's happening in the main events of the story. And then I thought it was even funnier how the Hiromi ship even looks like a cockroach. Just fun. All fun. I have a, had great fun reading these. Then we have issue 95. Title No Zeltrons. It's got really nice cover. Lumiar looks cool on the first page with the eyes showing. Akbar looks like his head's too big for his body though, which is funny. And it's funny that they're getting a group of Zeltron males to help out Leia after previously establishing a predisposition against Zeltron with Dany, Leia and Dany. Um, so she goes through that character progression a bit there. Leia and Han are going to Cabray, which first appears in issue 77. And Luke mentions he's going to Kinoween, another Uween planet. That's the first appearance of that one. And there's another new outfit for Danny. They're just like putting her in different outfits, of course. The Zeltron's trying to help Leia with her dress is funny. It is a good dress though. But it's funny how they just change around things. Now Luke has a different outfit for Kinoween. That's really cool 
panels with Luke encountering Lumia. This is brilliant. It's the first appearance of the Light Whip, and the first time Luke really fails, and I love that it's to Lumia and the Light Whip, and to the new idea, and he couldn't cope with it, and he actually fails in this, because you don't see him fail a lot in these old comics. He's by himself, with no help, and it's exciting. The, the cliffhanger, you're like, I want to read the next one, and so I did. Now, issue 96. It's still written by Mary Jo Duffy, but it's illustrated by Cynthia Martin and Bob Wycheck, apparently. And issue 95 was Cynthia Martin and Steve Lealoa. And I forgot to mention that, so there you go. But issue 96 is Jewel with the Dark Lady, which is awesome. But it's what's weird is the copy I had to read didn't credit the people who worked on it. So it must be in a different place. Which does come up later. Because it recaps what happened earlier. Because the issue is different, is there isn't dialogue in the fight scenes, so it relies on the facial expressions to tell the tales more. And previous di issues didn't do that as much, which is really cool and really speaks to the way the artists did it. It's got awesome panels with Lumia wielding the light whip, although a bit later on the backgrounds get less detailed compared to the characters themselves. And finally, it shows in depth how Luke is defeated and goes to the same panel at the end of the fight that we see at the end of the last issue. And then after that it credits the people. Which is different, but it's a unique issue. I thought it was very interesting that Lumia's henchman explains that the Light Whip has some energy blades and some solid ones. And this is the first mention of the Nagai, which follows on to later issues. And I thought it was funny, because Kiro finds the party dresses, like Han joked about in the last issue, because Han joked about, oh, we got these supplies, but then they'll have party dresses. And then Kiro finds party dresses, which is funny. Um, Kiro ends up saving Luke, as I thought he might. And it's creative how he modifies a helmet to help him breathe, because he's a fish person, and how he takes tools along to help Luke. And it, he helps Luke build a new lightsaber which is awesome. This is the first appearance of the Shoto lightsaber and it shows character development of Luke saying that he'll train Kiro as a Jedi but as he's saying this I feel a sense of foreboding that he might die. Like when Luke was going saying he was going to train the guy in Trispikura but that didn't work. And it's awesome seeing Luke use both lightsabers and what looked like an Atari based form of lightsaber combat. And oh, there's one thing to another as the Nagai fleet appears at the end. And it's just so exciting really when you get to this and the Nagai fleet's appeared. What's going to happen? You don't know. Because this is past Return of the Jedi. And thinking about when it was coming out, it's like, you really don't know what's going to happen with this Nagai. It's cool. Issue 97. Illustrated by Cynthia Martin and Art Nichols. That's the name that was on there. It's titled Escape. There's different song tripper designs on the first page of this book. The Nagai appear to have convinced a faction of the Empire to ally with them, which is interesting. And Luke doesn't have the Shoto lightsaber on his belt, I noticed, but he must have put it away or something that it doesn't show. Danny being tortured is really interesting to see the Nagai methods because the Nagai capture Danny and then they're torturing her uh, because they don't understand Zeltron. Of course the bad guys are the torture. They changed the way they drew the Ewoks and I think it looks better than the previous way. And Han swimming out as they aren't on the ruling council is a good plot development picked up from the earlier issue. I love how they have some random little Nagai banter similar to Stormtrooper banter. And Luke sneaking around reminds me of Leia in an earlier issue where she infiltrates the prison and sneaks around. Also, Kiro dies. Dies. We see him, looks like him died, by Den Siva's hand. Apparently, looks like. It's meaningful as he was protecting his friends and would have been a good end for him. But he does appear later on. This is the spoiler section. We're gonna. I'm going to cover that issue in the same video. 
Issue 98 is written by Archie Goodwin and illustrated by Al Williamson. So the original couple that were working on it came back for this one issue. It's called Supply and Demand. It's got a nice cover. It's got the same artist with Archie's earlier issues, which is cool. But, though to be honest, the art doesn't seem as good as the issues surrounding it. So, whatever you take of that, it's just my opinion. And the previous issue said the next one would be far, far away. But then this is supply and demand. And looking forward, there is no far, far away. So they uh, said, oh, the next issue will be far, far away. And then they never happened. That's even less sense than one earlier. Anyway, it uh, psyched me because I thought it was going to continue the story from the last issue. So it's weird that it breaks it up. But uh, anyway, it ended up sticking Han with a woman and her kids was a different idea as one of his jobs, and it's good to put him in a place where he'd be a bit more uncomfortable. It has the shipyards at Fondor, which is good to establish, so in the back here, the shipyards are at Fondor. There's a character named Orc, which is interesting. But I just felt like, issue 98, this adventure seemed out of place when you're reading everything in order, one after the other. But it is a fun read. And we get to issue 99, which is back to Mary Jo Duffy, illustrated by Ron Friends and Sam Della Rosa. And this one's titled, Touch of the Goddess. It's got a catchy cover, although Luke looks a bit weird on it. And this deals with the aftermath of Kiro's death. Uh, Fen Shizer appears again, in white armour with yellow underlining, which is interesting. And it has a note that a story will be told in issue 101 about how Fen Shizer got to be with them, which is interesting. It introduces Bay and summarises information, I guess told later, that he's half trailing and grew up with Han. Now, this is in the annuals, and I read the annuals afterwards, this is like, it's actually in one of the annuals. Not that happy. Just cool. It interests the planet of Godo and the species, and Han is going on more of a mercy mission, is different to other stories in this run, where he's mostly just pulled along or sent for his knowledge as a space pirate. It's interesting how the statues of the goddess and the minstrel from earlier are given much more importance in this story. And it jumps from place to place quickly in the search to get each statue back, revisiting the old places. It's a little bit rushed for the one issue. Lando not being inoculated is a good twist to put his life on the line. But Han's bluff is cool to see with the ships about the fire on Godo. And the ending is great in showing Han and Lando's friendship. And then we get to issue 100. Only about 8 issues to go until 100. Which is written by Mary Jo Duffy, illustrated by Cynthia Martin, and this is titled First Strike. It's a good cover, and a special double size 100 this year, which is cool. Han taking a theoretical exam is funny, I thought. Fen Shizer seems quite flirty with Leia. And Leia has blonde hair for some reason. Bay definitely has more of a barbarian type look. And this goes into Han's backstory with Bay, which is interesting. I wonder if it fits in enough that this is before Garrus Shrike picked him up. I would like to think so, that the, that would be before Garrus Shrike picked Han up and that it sort of fits together. Luke has three training almost now, that is training with during lightsaber practice with his blue lightsaber. When he should have a green one. Um, and Luke also trains with his second Shoto lightsaber, which is really cool to see. Apparently Lando created the computer exams, interestingly, which causes a problem which officially can't let, ha ha let Han and Luke fly, which is funny. But it works out in the end of it. Fen's back in green armour, but it looks a different design to Boba below the helmet, which is nice to differentiate it when you look at it. It's also someone with the same outfit next to him. I was thinking, oh boy, the Mandalorians are built on a lot more later on, which was actually really good. Han managed to take out the tough Macabre, 
which is one of the Nagai inventions, which is introduced in this issue, and it looks like a giant combat droid, which is interesting that Han managed to take it out. And this time, Lumia is back, leading the squadron of Nagai fighters, so she didn't quite die. Bay is the traitor, and it is B-E-Y. I thought it was an interesting twist that Bay was the traitor. And Han and Bay fighting is a good parallel with the past, which I thought was cool. Uh, Bay calls Corellia Corelli. Page 30, so instead of C O R E double L I A, he just takes off the A. And it reveals that Bay is half Nagai, which is interesting. And as to the plot, Knife, being sort of his half brother, explains why he, Knife, has a grudge against Han. Which is really cool because Knife is a Naga. Of course. Lando using Han's trick to defeat the enemy fighters is a nice lesson that you can't just judge the people through the theoretical evaluation exam thing. And apparently, Macabrees are a species, but they only look like robots and their central nervous system and brains are inside their bodies more. Not in their heads, but inside their bodies more, which is interesting. Then they finally leave Endor, and it feels like ages since they leave Endor, but anyway. That's why I think this still takes place before the Tris Procura, even though what happened. The art seems to be over not quite as good in this issue. The colouring and the shape of the faces seem even more off than surrounding issues, but it, the, it has improved to being, like I said, in most of the other recent issues. Ah, Far Far Away does appear. It's hit you on your one. It's so many issues afterwards. Anyway, it's Mary Jo Duffy and Cynthia Martin illustrating. Far Far Away, issue 101. Finally, this storyline was said to be the next one a few issues ago, which is weird. Anyway, I do have a note that this issue takes place before issue 99, which is interesting. And Leia looks too butch. And this is. Where Fenchiza appears and Han makes a scene from Boba the first time, despite the torso of his armor looking different. And um, possibly you could chalk that up to your artistic interpretation for that. It's interesting how Bay challenges Han to make sure he tells Leia how he feels. And Fenchiza changed the best guy game color to white in one of the panels, and it doesn't, it just looks like they didn't color it in, to be honest. It's interesting as Hand is teleported to a foreign planet where he has a fresh start and decides to go after the princess thinking himself. I put Hand, why did I put Hand? It's Han. Han is transported to a foreign planet where he decides to go after the princess thinking selfishly like I can charm her and marry her and stuff. That's really cool how Han did what he did to make the princess happy before he got back to Leia. But what happened with the energy balls? Oh, that was and they had these energy balls, and I'm like, what happened then? And in the last pa panel, Leia doesn't have pupils, which is so weird to me. Anyway. Issue 102. Mary Jo Duffy, again, and illustrated by Sam De La Rosa. It's called School Spirit. Lano and Luke return to Iskalon with news of Kiro's death, and of course, the Nagai. But it turns out that Kiro is alive. I wonder why they bring up Kiro again. And of course, they're going to fight the Nagai, and Kiro's doing his own little personal crusade. Which is interesting because they have powerful sonic weapons. The whole thing with the school following the leaders into collective suicide is an interesting dynamic to raise the stakes, but it's also like natural selection. Surely they should be smarter than that. I like how Luke uses his Shoto lightsaber. It's also waterproof, so he must have kept the part of the design from Anakin's lightsaber and when he created his lightsaber. And Kiro looks a lot more buff, which is interesting. And also, Kiro gets blasted saving the school of his colonians, so it looks like he dies. But it's interesting because Luke thinks he shouldn't survive, but then he turns up alive, which is interesting. And 
Oh, Kiro doesn't want Danny to know he's alive since he's protected his people from the Nagai. Cause so, because there was a subplot with Kiro hooking up with Danny. And it's interesting because he turns up alive and he's just like, I didn't hit anything essential. I thought some of the other Luke's face was weird. Then we get to issue 103. And it's his title, Tarp. The cover looks creepy, but it's also well drawn. At the end of the last issue, it said, What could be worse than the Nagai? And then it shows a Nagai again. Ooh. <laughs> and it reveals the knife survived the shot by harm, which of course he did. And then Den mentions an old enemy of the Nagai, which I'm interested to hear about them. Leia just so happens to be talking to the Zeltron boys back on taking the Zeltron boys back to the Tremble system where they mentioned coincidence? I think not. It's interesting how Leia ends up with a Nagai prisoner. I should note as well that the art when someone wakes up is an interesting way to do it all. This is an interesting this is a great story of a Nagai needing aid and Leia helping him. And you feel an emotional weight when he reports back truthfully and then is murdered by knife for being weak. But really establishes their whole culture as bad guys. And the interesting thing is they're going to be invading Zeltros, the home planet of the Zeltros. And then we go to issue 104, to sort of Nagai and Dolls. It's funny how the Zeltrons swarm Luke, because it's funny. And Lando, he's a player and smooth as ever. That's good. As a panel with Leia and the Zeltron smiling looks weird, the colours here aren't always right up to the edge of the line either. And Danny being completely different after her torture and the feeling loss of Kiro is a good plot development. And adds to her coming to Zeltros to convince them to join the war. It also goes along a the development of she just feels detached and she doesn't want to do the whole out from pleasure thing. Which is interesting. And oh boy, not just the Nagai want to take over Zeltros, but also the Hiromi! The cockroach people, which are hilarious through all of this. But I thought, oof, Danny and Leia fighting led to their capture by Dan Shiva. Leia got shot, but of course she wouldn't die because it's Leia. The Hiromi capturing Luke is a nice little development so both Leia and Luke are out of the way. And it was funny as well that they imply that Zeltrons want to go after the droids and when they come in there and that the, the Zeltrons are flirting with the droids as well. My party on Zeltrons actually looks quite fun with the and Zeltron's floating with everyone they see, they do that. But I like the difference with Han waiting for Leia while Lando seems to take it all in stride as the player he is. The Hiromi are hilarious as they think they've conquered Zeltros when they really haven't. And then the first order is to have lunch. They really are comic. And the Nagai swoop in and seem much more serious compared to the Hiromi, they're the real threat. It ends with the Nagai about to take the Hiromi prisoners actually having me interested in how it will turn out. Now, issue 105 is still written by Mary Jo Duffy but illustrated by Kenny Stacey. And it's titled, The Party's Over. I think of Mace Windu prequels. This party's over. I'm going to take a look at this. Anyway, you get a clear view that a Hiromi is eating a chicken and a burger. This is hilarious. You also see one news also see one using chopsticks. It's hilarious. And then the Nagai enemies come in. It seems that all parties are on Zeltros. Now Hiromi end up cowards after they break the door down, because they're really just comedy relief and cowards. And Pleaf reveals that the species that is the enemy of the Nagai are called Tops. They look like they're dressed in old Englishman garb, which is funny. And the battle starts with Luke, and he is a badass from re revealing his power to the top. He dual wields his lightsaber, which is awesome to see him fighting with both lightsabers. The commentary during the battle, mainly the Hujibs, is fun. The Hiromi end up 
helping Luke, which is interesting in their political comedy. And Danny ends up overcoming some of her anger at the Nagai to help more people at the urge of Leia, which is cool. And it was funny because the Hiromi cheer for everything. They cheer that they're victorious. And the last panel, panel is them confused when Luke says they'll attack the top, top shit. Because they're really cowards. Anyway, then it goes to issue 106. Which is titled My Hiromi. And, yeah. I thought of my Shrina. Then, do 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 My Hiromi. Anyway, the Hiromi dialogue is hilarious. A comedy relief. They're great, and it's interesting to see that the Toffs are better guards than Nagai by foiling the Zeltron boys' trick to escape. Because the Zeltron boys escape the Nagai, then we're captured by the Toffs. Zeltros seems quite an interesting planet by having parts with areas based on other cultures and architecture. Which I think is really cool, because it especially lines up to Zeltros being a pleasure planet. Art is an expression of pleasure and a culture, and so they have different art there, depending on who visits for the culture and whatever. I thought it was funny. No. Luke entering the top shit with the Hiromi. It's just gold. It's gold humour. And it's great. And he lets the Hiromi think that they're the only, they're the ones that did everything exceptionally. So they just cheer after everything. And then they have to be quiet, but they're just cheering quietly. <laughs> anyway, Luke just slaughters two toffs like nothing with his lightsaber, which is cool. It really shows his skill and how far he's come. And Luke inspiring the Hiromi is also hilarious. Uh, Luke also takes down toffs without his lightsabers, which really shows the force's physical and and then, and that was issue 106 and 107, the last issue of the original Marvel run, before the new 108 came out. And it's called All Together Now. It's written by Mary Jo Duffy, illustrated by Cynthia Martin. And this time skips the like, All Get Out. It's really weird, it, fits, it seems like a time skips to like, it reminds me of how the Terminator flashbacks look. Flash forwards? Since they were gone back in time, but anyway. Uh, Luke appears to have gone Rambo. It looks very much like Rambo, really buff and everything. And it seems to have skipped time where I think if they had more issues it would have gone into more detail of Luke escaping with the Hiromi and the Zeltron boys from the top ship and doing so much more. They hint back that the Toph were a huge threat and that who's there are the last resistance against the Toffs. And Leia has red hair now. Apparently Han has known Danny for years? And it's like, how far was this originally intended to be set forward in the timeline? Anyway. Um, Akbar says bitterus, not the real English word. Not a real English word, nor does it seem to fit his vocabulary. Anyway. Stormtrooper armor looks like it changed again. Then in the light the panel it looks more normal, which is interesting. And I was just noticing that Den has blue skin to Danny's red, which is interesting contrast. But they sort of ended up together and helping each other somehow. Their relationship now is also interesting as they've changed each other to be less like the culture of each of their people and so they're sort of outside of that. Um the top ship looks like a pirate ship, which I have a laugh at. Apparently as well, Bay saved Fen Shizer's world, which must be Mandalore. And a line informs us that Knife now knows that the Hugibs are telepathic. Lumia is also back at this point in time, of course helping the Toffs. Danny and Leia disguised in big dresses, which is interesting. And it reveals that Lumia also has some mastery over the Force that they didn't show in earlier issues, which is interesting. And, oh, it turns out Bay was an agent in the Toffs and helped save Leia by shooting Lumia, which is actually really cool how that ended up. And the thing with the Toffs is it's weird how they're all dressed like Victorian era heavyset men. It's like, eh, anyway. And I was through it. And it was the same size as the previous issue, so it, the story really kept me 
captured and interested in them. But this last issue felt like it was rushed and it would have had a longer storyline. The art in this issue though seems to have dropped in quality from the last and it seems like the best ones are from before issue 80 until around issue 95. You saw me go through what I thought the art a bit on the individual ones. And I saw some of the panels in the re-releases and it seems like they changed the colouring a little bit which is interesting and I prefer the older colouring. But yeah, so that was the rest of the 107 original Marvel Star Wars run comics. And overall, it's a roller coaster and a ride, but it's actually really fun. And they're definitely worth reading, I reckon. There's some great stories in there as well. So, thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you in the next video. Uru!